so we've all gathered here to talk about something that um, we are all very passionate about, uterine fibroid tumors. So let me start off by just asking the question, what should the world know about fibroids? Shay, let's talk with you. Um, I can only tell you what I experienced. I'm not a doctor like these two lovely individuals, but I experienced a lot. I'm pretty knowledgeable on my body. Um, fibroids destroyed me at one point. Um, I didn't date. Um, I cut off my family. I stopped working. Finances were just off. It just literally destroyed my life. And I'm just so happy that I have the knowledge that I have now so I can share it with other people. So fibroids, the situation that happened to me happened for a reason because I know I have the platform to help so many women. So I'm glad it happened and I'm glad I'm here with you guys to inform me on what I don't know because I don't know everything, but I'm here to learn and just share my story and hopefully help as many women as I can. Absolutely, because information is power, right? Absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Yes, you have the right to be informed, right? Absolutely, yes, yes. So what do you think the world should know about fibroids, Tamika? The world should know that you are not alone. That is what is most important, and that you don't have to suffer in silence. That is also important. Um, as anyone knows who goes through this journey as a fibroids patient, that oftentimes is debilitating, you feel so alone, you're on the bathroom floor by yourself, coupled over in pain, and that is so common for a lot of women. And a lot of times you just feel like no one else is experiencing this. So that's what our mission is about, making sure that women understand that they are not alone and that they don't have to suffer in silence. Absolutely, and you know, personally, I believe too that uh, women should understand that just because you've been diagnosed with fibroids doesn't mean that that's the end. It doesn't mean that that's the end of your story when it comes to fertility or when it comes to living just a happy, healthier life. We don't have to just kind of take our diagnosis and just live with it. There's more available out there. There's more information out there. We just have to find it. We have to make people aware of it. And that, you know, being diagnosed with fibroids uh, it just means that there's one more obstacle in your life you have to get over, but you can get over it. You can have a better life. And there is power in your voice. Absolutely. And power in your story. Absolutely. So I want each one of us to tell a little bit about who we are and why this campaign is so important to us. Um, we have some powerful stories, I think, between all of us. Um, so I really want to uh, just kind of talk about a little bit more about, uh, you know, why this campaign, this Fibroid Fighters campaign, and really bringing awareness is so important to you. So this entire campaign is really, really important to me because I believe this is connected to my purpose. I believe it's a part of my life's work to allow women to understand, once again, that they don't have to be alone, that they don't have to suffer in silence. Um, it's so surprising to me, I guess I shouldn't be shocked anymore, but every time someone shares their story, how everyone comes out of the woodworks like, girl, me too, my aunt, my sister, my cousin. So there's a lot of familiar familiarity in our stories, right? And so when I see um, doctors who are willing to um, almost be an advocate for patients, and I see celebrities who have a platform who are willing to be advocates for themselves. Um, I think as a celebrity, you know, it takes so much to share because there's already this public perception of you, right? I'm just a regular girl. <laughs> and I think it's important for me because I want to see doctors, I want to see celebrities share their stories because it, it automatically puts us all in the same category, right? And it makes me feel like um, my situation is not unique. And it also makes me feel like, as a collective, we can do so much. So when I see campaigns like this, it, it like warms my heart and gets me going and I become so passionate about it because I know this is what women need. I know they need to hear these stories and I know that um, sharing our story is really where all the healing and the purpose comes from. I really, so I get excited about stuff like this. Absolutely, and I really felt the same way too when I was uh, uh, just the, be the beginning phases of Red Alert, the fight against fibroids, the documentary, um, just meeting the women uh, who shared their stories and 
um, we all had just that same pain, hope and promise in common. And the more I heard women share, the more it drove me to bring more awareness and to seek out the truth, to find out why there is no why there's no real stated cause of fibroids, why there's no real cure outside of um, invasive surgery. At the time, I didn't know there was a cure outside of invasive surgery, so we'll talk more about that in a minute. But um, I, I really felt that um, as I was in production for the film. So I look forward to speaking with more women, uh, and I, I hope that between uh, you know the White Dress Project, Red Alert, and all the different initiatives that we have going on that more women will be able to live healthier, happier lives. Yeah, I think these moments need to turn viral, right? Mm -hmm. Just like anything else, like it's our bodies, it's our health, and I think our health and our bodies and our wellness really have to be just as captivating and entertaining and um, as important and lit as anything else, right? So it's important um, for us to continue the conversation. Absolutely. You have to get people used to even talking about yeah, something yes. like this because I've been raised to keep these type of situations very private, closed yes. off, secreted. So when I had my symptoms, because I've been raised that way, I didn't talk to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out a way to change that narrative. Get women to understand that it's okay to speak up and speak out. Absolutely. Because we can figure out solutions earlier than they think. I found out I have fibroids in my 30s, mm -hmm. but I noticed I had symptoms in my 20s and my teens. Wow. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I thought that was considered normal. Right. So let's figure out how to change that narrative so we're comfortable speaking out on this situation. Absolutely. And Shay, you have been really instrumental in that yourself by developing the Fibroid Day. But just real quick, um, I do want to refer to Dr. Jan and Dr. Flora Katz-Nelson, um, originators of the Fibroid Fighters Organization and USA Fibroid Centers. So I want to just start off by asking you, why is it so important that you have this campaign? You know the feeling that you walk around and you see things that don't make any sense? Yes and you know inside your head and heart you have a solution mm -hmm. and it's easy and you just can't get it why nobody else knows it. And that's what, uh, what happened with me. I'm not a gynecologist, I'm not an interventional radiologist, I'm a Harvard trained cardiac surgeon, but I've seen how medicine transitioned and from surgeries, it transitioned to minimal invasive surgery and then to percutaneous procedures and innovative treatment can change lives of millions of people. And we've done it in our organization. We had the USA Vein Clinics in, in many states, and we started treating fibroid disease. And the stories that were heard from the patients and improvement that they had after 30 minute procedures just was impossible to comprehend. Everything in life is, you know, risk and benefit, right? Risk and reward. And in a heart surgery, it's a big risk, big reward but I haven't seen anything else in medicine that you can offer curative treatment, meaning curative means treat it, fix it, that it will not come back, fix it, that will give decades of happy and productive life. You know, heart is good, but always, you know, usually older, elderly people, and you help them, and you know, you change the life, you prolong, it's great. You know, vascular care, it's fantastic, but Many patients come very late in life and, you know, in 50s and 60s and 70s. But when you have a 20 years old girl whose life will be ruined unless we help her, that's unparalleled. I have two girls myself. I mean, it's unparalleled. And I think to fix this inequality because of just bad luck, you know, someone just got hit for bad luck and, and think that they need to suffer, instead of uh, get a, a treatment and go on with a happy and productive life. I have a question. You know, what is the age of the youngest patient you've seen with fibroids? That's a really good question that okay. people might want to know. In, in, in 20s, just give a statistic. Between ages of 18 and 30, 26% of African-American women have fibroids. 7% mm -hmm. whites. By age of 35 to 40 years old, 60% of African-American women have fibroids and 30% whites. By age of 50, 80% of African-American women have 
fiber it and 70% white. It's, it's unbelievable. Why is it with my culture, African-American women receive fibroids more than a Caucasian? I don't understand. What is it, a genetic situation? A lot of it has to do with heredity, yes. So how do we prevent that? Meaning, is anyone trying to research to get to the core issue on why it's happening in the first place? That's a very good question. And um, the only reason why not so much research was placed into fibroids was because fibroids was a curable disease. You do a hysterectomy, there are no more fibroids. But then you can't have children with a hysterectomy. Exactly correct. And that's why now they're starting to do a lot more research to find out exactly why um, this is happening, uh, why the tumors, the muscular growths on the uterus are happening. And happening disproportionately in black women. Correct, yeah. correct, much more so in... Nobody spoke about this. Yeah. It, it was, uh, you know, taboo, I guess, you know, just a woman is born to suffer sometimes, you know, that they, compared to men, obviously, you know, the menstrual period, the pregnancies, the labor, there's many things, in addition to hard work at home, but <laughs> but people just didn't realize that it's possible to prevent the normalized abnormal. Absolutely. And, and that needs to change. When it comes to men, I think there should be a conversation where they're more sensitive and more understanding with this situation because I actually had to deal with the radio personality, my publicist was with me, and he wanted to speak on my issue with fibroids. But when he spoke on it, he said, I heard it was really bloody ill, live on the radio. So instead of, I was already used to kind of speaking on it and dealing with it, and I was prepared for any type of ignorance that came my way, so I didn't, what I did was I corrected him in a very respectful way. I just let him know that instead of coming at me with that approach or anyone in the situation that I'm in, try to have a different approach and be more sensitive because you can really hurt someone because this is not easy to deal with on a daily basis and you will never understand because you are a man. So just try to be sensitive. And I think it should be more conversations with men because really they really are unaware. We're already unaware because we don't talk about it. So men really don't know. It needs to be the high school education. These are health classes, right? About many things. Not fibroids. Correct, but about sex life, about yeah. pregnancies, about you know other things, menstrual period. It needs to be, the fibroids needs to be included Absolutely. in the curriculum. Everyone Absolutely. needs to know, if 26% of girls, you know, age, early age, 18, early 20, will already develop disease, why we absolutely must to talk about this. Well, I'm leaving that up to you. I know you can create a curriculum to go into the school. That would be amazing. A lot of girls don't want to go to a gynecologist even or their primary care physician because it used to be a male dominant profession. Mm. So they were very embarrassed to even yeah. bring this up. And men don't ask about it. Then they don't ask how many tampons do you use a day. They don't ask the length of your period. They don't ask. But that's to Shay's point earlier, changing the narrative on this whole thing. Absolutely. Because like she mentioned earlier, you know, she thinks that she started to have symptoms even like early teens. So I would argue that we probably need to be talking about this in middle, middle school. school. Yes. That's right? what I was thinking, to that's prepare right. you for what exactly. could possibly come. Exactly, because I know my symptoms started probably around 14 or so. Yeah. So you gave those statistics, which are all valid and true, but really what's happening to the young girls that are 12 to 15 when you're, you've already gotten your period, most likely, and you're starting to recognize the bloating and the, you know, three days of like soaking through pads. Like that needs to be discussed. And to Shay's point again, I think we just have to change the narrative on the whole thing so that we don't feel that this conversation is so taboo. Absolutely, and it seems like it's that way also generationally. It seems, yeah. you know, I know we've all had the same discussion where, you know, you didn't have that conversation with your mother, she didn't have it with her mother. Yeah. And so it trickled down generations, but it's also uh, gender differences yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So the men don't ask about it, you know, the women don't talk about it, and so now you've got generation after generation not having this discussion, mm -hmm. but then, you know, when it comes time to start talking about fertility, then we've got issues. Mm -hmm. Now the men and women are forced to talk and forced to recognize the fact that the wife or the significant other 
has an issue with fibroids, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's definitely important for us to address those kind of issues as well and make it okay, make it a conversation. Break Let the generational know. curse. Break yeah. the That's generational what we're gonna curse. do, break Absolutely. the generational curse. Right. Absolutely, so. yeah, so, you know, I applaud both you and uh, Dr. Yan and Dr. Flora for building this program um, and recognizing women who are really out there trying to become a voice to uh, really get the conversation going, bring awareness and make change mm -hmm. about this because it's so important and it's so necessary. Uh, you and I have had discussions and I'm sure you all may have had it with him as well, that there's so much attention put on other health issues. There's so much attention, you know, we don't wanna take anything away from anyone suffering from any other health issue out there like cancer or diabetes, but fibroids is even more, it's an epidemic. It is, but they have yeah. a strategy on what they've been doing for fibroids for so long, this is why they're here to change that. Right. I want to know why do you think so many doctors don't give the option of UFE? I didn't have that. That bothers me that mm -hmm. I didn't have that option because they cut me. Mm. Yes. I can't change that. How many doctors have you asked about your options for fiber? Three. How about you? I lost count. How about you? I think I went to four, but mine was an emergency situation, so it was kind of like I had to make a decision quickly. But even with quickly, I went to four doctors. And UFE was never an option. Not for me, me either. either. They yeah, never, either. I never even heard of it yeah. Yeah. until now. Yeah. When I researched All right. you guys. Let me just explain what is uterine fiber embolization. So, just want all of us to be a little optimistic. There is another world there. There is a solution. Okay, so it's a, it's a very positive what we start right now. So let me describe the procedure. A tiny catheter is inserted in the, at, um, at the place of wrist or groin, and a long catheter, one millimeter in diameter, is inserted in the body. It goes from here all the way to the origin of uh, artery that feeds the fiber tumor. Tiny catheter takes few minutes to do. Then a drug inject. So drug is basically particles, thick particles that clog this artery. Without blood supply, fibroids shrink, they dry out, shrink, and get absorbed by the body. And then you just remove everything and an hour, two hours later, two hours later the patient can go home. That's the procedure. No pain? Pain is We've done under local anesthesia, and we've done under light sedation. Oh, you have options. Have options. Usually under light sedation, like okay. a, similar to gastroscopy or colonoscopy. And there's no cut, no. No cut. And you can go. And home. just put pressure for a few mm -hmm. minutes, and that's it. And, and you, you go home. The same day. In an hour, two hours. And you're in the office. You're not even in the hospital. It's done in the office. We have 40 offices in New York City alone. It's done in the office. You come up the street, you know, go to Does subway. it matter the size of the fibroid? It doesn't matter? 90%, okay. 95% can be treated. It's early. You know, doctors sometimes talk about very unique cases. Mm -hmm. but trust me, we like easy ones. <laughs> like someone come, you help them, they go home, feel good. Yeah. You know, mission accomplished. No drama is needed. I wish this was an option for me. It's been around ago. for more than 20 years. But the three doctors that I spoke with never mentioned. I would suggest you, you to me. call them and ask them. And they'll probably hang up on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, right. I mean, I, I understand that when it comes to medicine, the money is in the medicine, not the cure. I've, I've researched and I learned that. So I'm like, so how would we transition women and doctors in hospitals to? give us an option of what you do, what's been around forever. A so awareness. they have another option not, not to do what I did. Awareness, awareness and awareness and awareness. Uh, you know, it's a, even if you go on, on websites or different, even universities, say fibroid dreams have this and this and this, uterine fibroid option will be there. UFE is there, but it's the last one. You know, and actually I want to, I do want to touch on what Dr. Flores said because I know that I, when I asked my own physicians about it, they said, well, you could do UFE, but you can't get pregnant afterwards. Not true. Simply not true. Simply not true. So I, I'll, I'll give you an example of our studies. We, we 
evaluated the first three and a half thousand patients that we've done, three and a half thousand. And the uh, success as far as defined as the need for a recurrent procedure was, uh, we needed recurrent procedure in 1.2 percent. So 98.8 .8 was wonderful, okay? And this 1.2 percent was when doctors just started with us, first two, three months of their practice. So as you do, we have doctors do 10, 11 a day. 10, 11 a day. You, you, you get better with the practice, right? I'm just speaking like an annoying, like any person, if they do something more often, they become very good. So the results are phenomenal. You just need to be very consistent, follow all the steps, and, and make sure everything is right. And I remember from my day of heart surgery, there was a studies that clearly showed the hospital with a high number of heart surgery procedures have by far better uh, survival, better uh, results than small hospitals when they do just few a, a year. Obviously, the same thing with everything we do. We do it more, we do it better. But there's no questions. Imagine if you have a, a, a in a book, a choices, you have a headache, right? You have different choices. Tylenol, um, guillotine, others, like, because it it's hurts, right? So uterus hurts, we'll just remove it. Absurd. That's been around for 100 years, more. You know, so things move, there's a progress. And we can speed up this progress, not by inventing new treatments, by just making this treatment available and affordable and accessible to everyone. And it starts from education. I have a question. Is there a preventative measure once we have the UFE? Is there a preventative measures to prevent fibroids from coming back? Or do you even know why they come? Because I've heard it's been estrogen. I've heard it's foods. I mean, everyone has their own scenario. But as doctors, I would prefer to know where do you think it comes from? And what, how can we prevent, our, prevent ourselves from having fibroids again? What do I stay away from? Foods, deodorants, what is it? Wine, estrogen. It's definitely. I get a different answer every time. Yeah, That's the funny part. Absolutely. It's definitely related to estrogen. Yeah. And and it's almost self-cured disease. By the time a menopause, it disappears. Right. So it's it's there's also a connection be, between uh, most probably between uh, fibroids and endometriosis, and which is very common. People with uh, women with a, a symptomatic endometriosis, 26 percent of them have fibroids. And a woman with the symptomatic fibroids, 20% have endometriosis. And think, endometriosis is it's a backflow of, uh, of uh, uterine content, right? The cells from uh, uterus just travels, not shed it, you know, through the uh, down with the period, but they just go up through fallopian tubes and, and goes into abdomen. And uh, what's interesting, the more uh, heavier menstrual period, and more pressure inside the uterus and more backflow is expected. That's why there's a treatment for, suggested treatment for endometriosis to remove uterus, a source. Ridiculous. I but, but, yeah, that but, is not but, the option that should be given at all. Okay. But it's like you you're ripping a part of the woman out. You're ripping a piece of me. You're taking a part of me away. And Flora can attest there's, a, um, you know, she sees patients with the complications after that. Tons of complications after, after hysterectomy. Yeah. Tons of complications. Number one, there is, since uterus occupies a big portion of the pelvic um, mm -hmm. floor, after removing it, there is bladder prolapse rectal prolapse mm. people do not want to have intercourse because everything is coming out mm -hmm. coming down bleeding um from other you know yeah. from hemorrhoids from from it, it it's really not uh, everything falls down yeah that's the uterus keeps things together yeah and They're it just falls down. yeah everything comes down so um nine percent of women after hysterectomy develop addiction to opioids because it's pain. To what? Opioids. Are you serious? Yeah, because it's painful. Myomectomy is painful. Hysterectomy is painful too. It's very painful. They gave me a strong drug. I took it twice and I couldn't take it. It made me feel dizzy, sleepy. I didn't feel myself. And I'm like, I don't know what this I'm is. I'm glad you didn't like it. Yeah, I don't do drugs. Sorry. So Tylenol would yeah, be but, good but, for me. But it can be very slippery slope. 
Yes. So it's a it's an addictive prescription, clearly. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I had that experience after my last myomectomy a few months ago. I was how many um, did you have? I've, I've had two myomectomies, um, and I've had a yeah, and I've had a total of thirty five fibroids removed from oh, my wow. uterus. Um, but my second myomectomy, they give me uh, oxycontin um, for the pain, and I had never taken that before, and I cannot describe to you how horrible I felt after taking that pain medication twice. And it was also given to me intravenously after surgery. So I asked them for something different and they were very reluctant to give me something different while I was in the hospital. Um, they had to go through the chain of command and ask the head nurse to give me a different pain medication and finally they gave me tramadol or morphine. And my body could tolerate that a little while longer, but I knew that that was something foreign in me and I did not want it. And it made me sick and they had to give me another medication to combat some of the side effects from that medication. So before I knew it, I was on that and two other medications to help with the symptoms from that. So um, I took myself off of pain medication and just healed uh, naturally after surgery. You are an exception. Most of the patients do continue taking Oxycontin yes. and morphine, and that's why there's a stigma. They're perceived as drug seekers, but they're not. Can you share your story about your first myomectomy, that supposedly minimal invasive option? How was it, this minimal option, invasive option for you? Absolutely. Um, my first myomectomy was in uh, 2014, and um, I had been having some very severe problems. I'd been to the ER, like you mentioned as well, an emergency situation. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of health care options and, and things like that. But the doctor that I saw, she was also a fertility specialist, so she assured me that she could save my ovaries, save my uterus, and uh, remove the fibroids. And at the time, we didn't know how extensive they were. So uh, I had the surgery. Uh, after the surgery was over, I was in the recovery room, and my mother was sitting next to me, and she said that I just turned white. And um, she just said I lost color, and I lost consciousness. And uh, come to find out, I had developed a hemorrhage because I had so many cuts. And so uh, I remember waking up in the um, intensive care unit and I was there for seven days um, in and out of consciousness. Uh, my parents slept in the room, in a very small room with me. And um, I just remember waking up and seeing that I was hooked up to so many wires and being afraid and not really know what was going on or why I was really there. And um, I was also raised in a religion that didn't take blood transfusions. So even though I'm, I'm not necessarily practicing that religion anymore, that was kind of a belief that I held on to. So I didn't really want a transfusion. So that was an issue as well because my blood level had dropped pretty significantly. It, yeah, my hemoglobin was very low. And so um, I, uh, you know, they, they tried to do the cell saver during surgery, but that still did not work because there were so many cuts. So I spent that seven days there trying to heal and recover around the seventh day. Um, after a lot of prayer, <laughs> my level started to go back up, um, but I continued to stay in the hospital for a few more days. So uh, the surgery caused me to lose my job. I was unable to drive from home location to work, so I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't able to keep my, my position. Um, and so I was on short-term disability for a while and it took me a good year before I was able to really get back to normal and to drive further than maybe about 30 miles. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're here, honey. I'm and you here. look amazing. <laughs> good for you. Well, thank you. You made thank it. You. <laughs> Devastating to hear stories like that. And yeah. we hear these stories from thousands and thousands of of people who come to us. We had one girl who came in with a hemoglobin of five. Oh, wow. And in heart surgery world or cardiology world, that's a no-no. I mean, if we see somebody below eight, we already, you know, she came in with five. We weren't even sure how she's, she was walking. So, uh, on the New Year Eve, a person came in Philadelphia and our doctor sent us a text. I just saved someone's life. 3.5, three and a half hemoglobin black woman that look pale yeah. and 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 uh, you know thank god we, we had these devices to check blood from the stick 3.5 sent to the hospital 
was easy, like very pale, heart is racing, blood pressure is low, she came with a husband, and they had no idea that woman had a, you know, a bleeding from fibroid, and she was going to doctors. Absurd. That's been my case too. My, my lowest hemoglobin level was a three. I've had seven blood transfusions, and I'm similar to you. It, it wasn't really a religious thing, but just like a cultural thing, you know, that you just, you don't have, take blood transfusions mm -hmm. from anybody, right? So it was very difficult for me. So having to do multiple blood transfusions, all just because of iron deficiency, because of benign tumors, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear that, it just becomes extremely frustrating. So I completely relate to your story. You became anemic once you figured it was from fibroids or you were anemic before? So that, that's a great question, but I think it really has been connected. Doctor, I was, going, I was going to ask you that because the symptoms I experienced, it just seemed like they've been around, they just got worse in my 30s. So iron, very easy. What is iron? It's a component of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is in red blood cells. That's what carries the oxygen. When you bleed, you lose blood, you lose, you create, you know, it creates anemia, and uh, it's not because your uh, a blood bone marrow cannot create. Okay, there's nothing wrong with the bone marrow. It's just not enough iron. It's already wasted. All right, it's gone. That's what's called iron deficiency because you lose blood. All right, and and slowly, and and that's why you give iron. If you get iron, you have constipation. It's terrible, and uh, and blood transfusion. It's not just religious. It, that's, it's not a very good idea right. to, yeah. to, to, to get blood. Medically too. Yeah. In a heart surgery, 20, 30 years ago, we were giving blood freely. Below 10, we give. Below 8, you give. Now it's below 7, you have investigation. What is going on? Why? Because there's a risk. A risk of blood transfusion. Hepatitis, other diseases. That's why I didn't want my blood transfusion. Why, why would you do? We actually work with Jehovah's Witness. We've met with them. They have, a, you know, international. They have a U.S. leadership in New York. We met with them. We have centers of bloodless surgery, like actually no surgery. When women have anemia, Jehovah's Witness, there are some studies that show if your hemoglobin low, let's say seven or lower, your chance of survival from simple thing that otherwise would be fine post regular surgery, post trauma, is 50 percent. I mean, it's like 50 percent worse. Like your mortality is much, much worse. Because when people start with a high hemoglobin, okay, a little blood loss, not a big deal. But you, when you have start with very low, that's it, you have no margin for errors. No margin for errors. Why? Why, you know, a man, Jehovah's Witness, a man is safer than women because of the, you know, menstrual period and big time menstrual period because of the fibroids. So if someone, you know, really cares not to get blood, they need to be a triple caution and they need to evaluate themselves for fibroids and, and take care. Absolutely. So how do we get back to how do women learn more about their options? Do we need to be doing campaigns with gynecologists and doctors like yourself? Um, because if, if the three patients that are here have experienced not having that as an option, not for whatever reason it wasn't an option for the three of us. So what do we need to do with gynecologists? I did my job. I've met with a very beautiful, famous woman. You have many friends, you tell what we do. And seriously speaking, it is possible. We in the mission of creating a system, nationwide system for accessor, accessible and affordable care. It's covered by insurance, covered by managed Medicaid, covered by Many just need to call or, or schedule online. Now, how do we let people know? Need to share the stories. I know it's not comfortable, it's embarrassing, it's uh, devastating even to recall those moments of suffering and, and, and uh, misery. But if you feel comfortable doing this, tell all your friends, a million people that follow you, and ask them to share with everyone they know. Absolutely, and I want to actually, that's a great segue into, uh, earlier I mentioned about Fibroid Day. Um, I want you to just kind of describe what Fibroid Day is and why you decided to start it. Um, I got with my publicist, 
Jen. I know I always start off like that because we do everything together, but um, I had just experienced the fibroid situation. I went through my surgery, and because it was on television, the reality show I was on, I had so many women reaching out. So I'm, I'm one individual, but how do I help all of these people at one time? So I said, you know what, I want to do an annual event, and I love your purple tie because that represents fibroid awareness, which is the J July of every year, so it's really cute. But um, So I wanted to give back somehow and bring awareness towards the cause because no one was speaking on it. So I had this day, Fibroid Awareness Day with Jen. It was amazing. We had doctors come out. We had so many different individuals that spoke on their story. We had people in the crowd that were informed. A couple people realized that they had the same exact symptoms and they were pretty sure they had fibroids. So I said, I know I'm just one person, but if I can branch out and make this event as big as possible with the help of my new friends, and of course you guys, I think that we can bring the awareness that you're talking about. Because if we make this loud, speak up and speak out, that's my campaign, speak up and speak out. And we go loud with this, we'll be able to reach the people. We'll be able to reach more people than you think we can. Because women wanna know, they just don't know where to go. So let's just redirect them. Absolutely. We have the people to redirect them too. Absolutely. And uh, Tanika, I want you to mention uh, your white dress project. You all have been extremely instrumental in uh, not only just bringing awareness toward women, but you've been busy in Washington, D.C. as well. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I work for the media, so I understand the importance of making sure that campaigns happen, that things are done legislatively and policy, that's how people get interested. And then you include celebrities and have their story shared. So, you know, I do agree with Shay, like, you know, we can have this huge moment, um, but we just have to get people talking about it. So yes, I'm so excited about the White Dress Project, all that we've been able to do. We are the ones who um, introduced the legislation to get July as Fibroid Awareness Month. So every time I hear someone say it, I'm like, <laughs> yes, I get so excited about that because I'm like, that was really our hard work. Like we went to the Capitol, knocked on doors, asked congresspersons to, um, you know, sign on to the legislation. So it was really a big deal for us when we were able to get that passed. And, and how much was it? I'm sorry, you have to say the number. <laughs> five, Listen at this. Yes, $500 million. Woo! So, so fibroids <laughs> research, yes. $500 million. Yes, and I really have to shout out our new vice president, um, Kamala Harris, um, because she, right before she, it was announced that she was going to um, be the vice president, um, she introduced legislation uh, that would also bring in the CDC and other agencies. It's called the Uterine Fibroid Education and Research Act. Um, so we're excited about that because we know that a lot of, the, you know, we're in America, so a lot of this stuff has to be legislative and policy driven um, along with celebrities and along with patients sharing their stories and along with doctors who care, so. Oh, phenomenal, well, phenomenal, yeah, phenomenal. Thank you. I want to be involved with whatever you have going on with the white dress movement. You like yes, the, oh, okay. I, was, I you don't like think we have dress, a choice right? anymore. I'm just, I love the dress, <laughs> but the January. movement behind it, I have to be Absolutely, behind. absolutely. So maybe speak up and speak out. Yeah. Shea Johnson, Done. white dress Done. movement Done. together. Done. USA Fibroids, come on. Yes. Educate them on UFE, let's do it. Absolutely, and I personally am excited and thankful and to And this is both our host. <laughs> I'm thankful to both of you. Yes, yes. Um, because you guys are a part of the uh, Red Alert, the Fight Against Fibroids documentary, and I'm so thankful to have the presence of both of you. Um, I was listening to you when you were asking the questions of why, why, why. That's the original reason why I started this film. I said, I need to know why this happened to me. I, it cannot be in vain. It cannot be in vain. I said, I need to make purpose behind it, and I need to help women along the way as many as I can. You know, and so that was the reason why I really, it really drove me to get those answers. So hopefully I can do you all justice and all the women out there who are suffering through the documentary and get some of those questions answered or get more people talking about this. You know, get to those medical schools and, and you know, get more interventional radiologists involved and things like that. Oh, it's going to happen. You just spoke it into existence. That's what I believe. I speak it, it will happen. Many people, like Jan was saying, many babies. Yeah. <laughs> There will be babies, right? Can you imagine? I have a miscarriage, Almost. and I'm sure it came from fibroids. 
A lot of women don't know a lot of your miscarriages come from fibroids. So the list of symptoms, I think we should go through the list of, list of symptoms. We didn't really, so I think you should, you're the best. Let's hear it from you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can definitely do that, but I'm not the one who experienced them. So yeah. please, please help me out. So what anemia, you, the pain is the number one. Yes. When people come, they complain of severe pain, bloating, and severe bleeding. Yes. Bleeding and mm, they uh, suffer either menstrual periods last two weeks, three oh, weeks, longer. Yeah. Yeah. sometimes up to a month, sometimes they never stop. Yeah. And you know, that's why people become anemic. Yeah. That, that's the reason. But pain is still the number one. Then there's constipation mm -hmm. because fibroids get so big, they can be on the back wall. So, and people think it's normal. People think constipation is absolutely normal. They live with it. Women don't know that they're supposed to go to the bathroom right. three times a day or after every meal. They think once every 10 days no. is okay. <laughs> so, you know, and pain, okay, so we'll tolerate. We'll take some Advil, some ibuprofen, like you said, maybe go through a full bottle of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes there's frequency in urination. I have that. So yeah. people yeah. run to the bathroom. Some people can't even sit through a full movie. They have to get up two or three times. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> yes. I was always that girl on road trips. We know we got to stop at the bathroom yeah. for Tanika. <laughs> like, I, yeah. Then there is a also a taboo that people don't talk about is painful intercourse. Yes. And the women, a lot of women, think it's normal to have painful intercourse. Yes. So that, and they don't talk about it, they don't say it, and they're afraid to have it. Mm -hmm. Then they don't want to have a boyfriend, then they isolate themselves, they miss work. So at work they're known as those, oh, you know, she's not gonna come again. Oh, you mm -hmm. know, it's that time that she's, she's missing work again. And that's not right. People should not be perceived and look at the opportunities people are missing because of this absentee. Absolutely. It's like a child. Yeah. Because of those so many miscarriages, they don't even know why they're having miscarriages. Exactly, exactly. They're not recognizing the symptoms. And the real version of that, the everyday version of that, I know for me, um, I got to the point where I couldn't wear my beloved stilettos anymore because I'd have so much pelvic pain. If I wore heels that were too high, I had to give up my heels and I would be tired all the time. And so it just, you know, your friends may not understand, oh, your I significant understand. other you may not understand. can't give up the heels, honey. <laughs> we don't do that. We're going to figure this out. <laughs> the heels are safe. <laughs> and, then, and then speaking um, from, you know, an older standpoint, uh, women over 40 standpoint, um, the weight gain that I experienced behind being cut twice uh, in that area is very difficult because any woman who may have had a c-section can tell you that losing weight in that area becomes di more difficult after that. So, you know, with the estrogen imbalance combined with, you know, the uh, pain from uh, the pel in the pelvic area, um, it can be very frustrating. And then I'm not a mother yet, but I know women who have multiple children who still deal with fibroids, who still deal with the fatigue from anemia, who still deal with not being able to function, but being forced to function and suffer in silence and just push through. Very valid, valid point that all of this combined creates tons of psychological issues. Yeah, I was just gonna say that there is a mental health component that we absolutely have to talk about because there's something that is so daunting about bleeding for 21 days or always wearing black or always feeling like you gotta be like, I'm not in the mood tonight. Like after a while, a guy is like, what do you mean? Like, get it together, you know? So those are symptoms too that are often like hidden. Um, that aren't necessarily physical, but are just as important to talk about because they strain a woman, um, you know, having to take PTO when you're not going on vacation. Um, the mental health component is a big one. Most certainly, absolutely. We actually talk about that in my film. Um, I yeah, it with, um, because a, I had that issue. Yeah. Um, they, you had asked what was the worst experience I had with fibroids. It was my mental health because I couldn't get it together. My mental health was off, so I couldn't work. I didn't work out. Um, I just, I didn't date, I didn't go anywhere. I had accidents in public, so it kept me enclosed. So I just separated myself. It literally puts you in a position to alienate yourself from the world. So you think what's worth physical pain or psychological pain? Psychological, I'm sorry. Exactly. My mental health was off. Yeah, yeah, and the physical pain just makes it even worse. Yeah, right that just so. adds to it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, because when your period stops, you're still thinking, at least for me, it was like, okay, it's ended now, but right. it's coming back. 
I get a, I get a relief for one week, exactly. but you know so something else coming is coming back. back. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to just kind of close out with talking about what we like to see or what we can. Uh, I know we all got our own initiatives, but just personally, what would you like to see for fibroids, uh, women suffering from fibroids and fibroid education um, in the next five years, um, Dr. Young? So we called out initiative fibroid fighters because we realized that you need to fight. It needs to be very proactive to fight to get care you want and even to be heard. Uh, I guess you called your you know, a project is a white dress because it's a dream, but it can be mirage or it can be real. And uh, you know, you suffer through a lot and I think the best we can do is unite and uh, there cannot be a better time than today when uh, uh, even there's a legislation and, and we have initiatives and Kamala Harris initiative, we actually wrote email to her exactly with the points what needs to be done. Because initiative is about research. You do research when you don't know what's going on. Actually, we know what's going on and it needs to be explained what's going on and benefits of uterine fiber embolization, the cheapest and easiest procedure that saves uterus and you can be pregnant and it's inexpensive. We ask, let's educate the girls and boys in school. Let's make sure that every insurance covers it in the office. For example, in New York, many, um, in New York, many managed Medicaid's they uh, allow this procedure to be covered in the office, but the uh, insurance says, oh, we have all, pretty much all managed Medicaid. Oh, we have plenty of interventional radiologists. There's no need for you. So theoretically, yes, but no access to care because doctors cannot be signed up with this insurance. In Illinois, Medicaid covers this in the hospital, but not in the offices, which makes no sense whatsoever. So all those things, three, we need to invest in the public education. Everyone knows about breast cancer. Everyone knows about lung cancer. Everyone knows you should not smoke. And you know, that's wonderful. That's many, many good things happen. But because of taboo, nobody speaks about fibroids. So our goal is to make sure that we create this world that's in my head, absolutely possible. In our organization, we make thousands of women happy, but we can eliminate this disparity this inequality that's unlucky ones got and we want every woman i think every woman deserves happy and healthy life pursuit of happiness instead of suffering absolutely and this generational thing needs to be solved like it's not like this everyone suffered i suffered it, it's not like a army right you know it's a it's a it's a big thing and we can do it together starting from education and just talking about and sharing with everyone uh, what you have to say. I agree. I feel that unity brings change. And the fact that we're all here united as one, if we bring our brands together, do you know how much noise that we can make? And I can see it happening. So I'm hoping in the next five years, we will have came together, started an, an additional movement, get as many people as we can involved to bring change towards fibroids and hopefully try to come up with what is the core issue and how do we stop this from happening to us? That would be great if people will share the story. Like what will be my life without fibroids? Mm -hmm. Like this 20 years, 30 years that I lost, you obviously know. I would have had kids by now. I believe I would have had kids by now. Yeah, I think that is a major reason why I didn't. But I'm not blaming the situation. I just had the, a lack of knowledge and my mother didn't know. so. I'm here to educate. It won't happen with my generation. I'm breaking the curse now. So I will educate my kids. I'm having kids. Me too, girl. <laughs> <laughs> All three of us. Yes, absolutely. We want children. Absolutely. <laughs> and now we have that opportunity. Yes, we do. And as a man, I can say, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> no, but, but listen to this. Like, again, we have presence in 18 states, but 40 locations in New York. And we see how New York gets better every year in the last five, six years. Enormous, Brooklyn, Bronx. But it's not the buildings and even cleanness, other things that change the community. It's happiness of wives, of moms, yes. of women. And, uh, and, I, and I feel that it's lacking. Yes, 
women who aren't too tired to take care of the home because of fibroids and things like that, or, or just take care of themselves, because I found myself in that position too, so um, I completely understand the Generations that. owe to moms and women, and we absolutely need to make sure that we give women a much better life. I absolutely agree with that. We are, you know, women are the queens of the world, you mm -hmm. know, and we need to embrace that. And if we are not healthy and we're not living our best lives, then everything else is suffering. Yes. Um, so I would like to see more legislation. I would like to see more collective action with, you know, like we're doing here today. And I would like to see, um, I think Shay said it best in the beginning, just change the narrative. Like, there's no more stigma, there's no more taboo, we aren't scared, this isn't squeamish, 50% of the population bleeds, like, right. we really have to get to a place of, like, we gotta get over it, you know? And if this were something that were happening to men, mm -hmm. there would be commercials and marketing and yes. all of this stuff happening. All kinds of money. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So I really feel like we just have to get to that place with this and I think, um, I think we will. Like, yes. you know, we're here, we're three strong patients, right? And together, I think we're determined to move it. And then with collaborations like Fibroid Fighters and USA Fibroid Center, I, I, I think it's just a matter of time. And Fibroid Awareness Month, I didn't even know you had something to do with that. <laughs> so clearly, it, it's getting out there. Yeah. I heard about it, didn't even know it came from you. So, <laughs> yeah, the word's traveling. <laughs> oh my girl, it's you! Hey! Thank Aww. you! <laughs> yeah, Dr. Flora, what would you like to see for fibroids uh, patients and awareness over the next five years? I would love to see healthy patients. I would love to see many healthy babies. I would love to make sure that people don't hide and um, understand and know and know that there is something out there that can be done to. Uh, to make sure that they're not suffering. And something simple, something something like uterine fibroid embolization, yes. something very simple and so generations of happy babies. Yes. And I just want to say too, just really quickly, that women have to take some of the onus on ourselves, right? I believe in um, being the CEO of my body. And my medical team, they're my personal medical team. So if I'm not interested in what you have to say, I seek a second opinion. I'm not interested in what you have to say, I seek a third, fourth opinion. And that is not to challenge, obviously, what they've learned in medical school, because I'm not a doctor. But I firmly believe that nobody knows your body like you do. So you have a, a part to play in the conversation of whatever is being offered to you as, as guidance. Absolutely. And I personally want to be able to Google fibroids and all of the options pop up, all of the right information pop up, all of the information that we've discussed um, that has been hidden in the shadows, the misinformation uh, expelled, and so I want women to be able to feel confident about themselves and confident about their, their health um, overall. So um, that's really what I want to see is, is more education, definitely, um, and, and definitely what you said about taking control of your own health. The Washington Post just recently published the unknown disease, fibroid. Unknown. Uh, unknown. unknown. After so many years, I read that um, in my research for the film that they have uncovered fibroids in ancient Egyptian mummies. There has been studies that uncovered fibroids in ancient... So if they found them way back then, why are we still questioning what's going on now? So, you know, it's, it's, the research has been really remarkable for the documentary, but I still have, there's still so many unanswered questions like you posed earlier. So I look forward to all of us being able to come together to, to fight for those answers as ambassadors, as um, uh, CEOs of our own body, and as founders of amazing programs, and as doctors who have made it their passion and their goal to help women to stop suffering. So thank you all for this enlightening, enlightening delightful discussion. It's been amazing. I look forward to see what we can all do together to help eradicate this issue for so many people. Can I get a one, two, three, five boy fighters? One, two, three, five, five boy fighters! fighters. <laughs>